When I hear the term innovation, and I usually imagine Steve Jobs on the podium at Apple, presenting the first iPhone or introducing the iPod or one of those things, or Elon Musk introducing the next Tesla model. These are the examples and these are the names that have become synonymous with innovation. And they have brought us disruptive products. They have built some of the richest companies in the world. They have literally changed the world. And they're, they're the symbols of radical innovation. As product managers, we have a lot we can learn from these innovators, but the biggest impact most of us will have um, through practicing incremental innovation. So in the next few slides, I'll talk about the elements of incremental innovation, the nuts and bolts of the product manager's job and why it pays to learn to do it well. As we say in Atlassian, good day and thank you for being here. My name is Vlad Zakari, and I'll be sharing what I have learned in more than 15 years in technology and product management. So why innovation? The purpose of innovation is to come up with new ideas and technologies that increase productivity and generate greater output and value with the same input. So this is a good reason. Let's, uh, let's put it into some context. According to McKinsey, 84% of the executives say that their future success is dependent on innovation. At the same time, according to Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, 95% of all product innovation fail, and according to the Startup Genome Report, 92% of all startups fail. So right off the bat, we have more than 80% of executives think that their current business models are at risk to be disrupted in their future. And despite the dismal success rate of the product innovations, this is still the number one source for businesses to gain competitive advantage. So according to this same McKinsey Global Innovation Survey, only 6% of the executives are satisfied with their innovation performance. What's more, according to a 2017 study of PricewaterhouseCoopers, 54% of innovating organizations have trouble bringing, bridging the gap between innovation strategy and a larger business strategy. What are some of the problem areas? Well, according to Boston Consulting Group, the top six obstacles for innovation performance would seem to be mostly related to choosing and executing the best ideas, but also a certain, to a certain extent, the company culture. Here is what BCG found. In 42% of the cases, the development times were too long. In 32%, they had issues with selecting the right ideas. In 31%, it, they had difficulty with the risk averse culture of the organization. In 25%, they experienced a uh, lack of coordination. And uh, in 22%, they felt they lacked enough great ideas. And in 20%, they struggled with marketing innovations. So since we are on the data, here is some more research data that's relevant here. According to a Deloitte Global Board survey from 2016, the Board of Directors overall understanding of company strategy is the weakest with regard to talent management and innovation R&D strategy. So the main takeaway here is that while companies recognize the value of innovation, they're still struggling with how to make it work. In other words, there is a lot of opportunity to innovate on how companies innovate. And this is going to be our job as product managers. Here is some more context, by the way. According to a 2015 Accenture survey, a whooping 82% of organizations run innovation in exactly the same way as they would go about achieving an incremental performance gain in their regular operations. This seemed to lead to quite a few different challenges, such as 72% admitting to missing critical growth opportunities and 60% struggling to learn from past mistakes. So in summary, innovation helps companies grow. Innovation keeps organizations relevant. Innovation helps, organiza uh, innovation helps organizations differentiate themselves. And innovation is possibly the weakest link with the lowest efficiency in reliability 
and delivering results. So let's shift gears. And when we talk about what innovation is and how much businesses depend on it, I need to take a step back. We need to take a step back and take a deeper dive into why we need innovation. And the quick and simple answer is because it, in a free market economy, this is how a business can achieve a competitive advantage. And here I would like to share the framework for competitive advantage there and spend some time talking about the why of innovation. This is a diagram from the jobs to be done framework created by Anthony Woolwick. Let's go through these quadrants very quickly. Top left is the differentiating strategy. So businesses pursue this when they discover and target segments of customers with a new product or service that can do the job significantly better. Examples of successful differentiated strategy include products like the Nespresso coffee maker, the iPhone, the Whole Foods approach to organic foods, the, the Bang & Olufsen headphones, BMW cars, Dyson vacuums, etc., etc. You, I'm sure you get the picture. What these products have in common is that they get the job done significantly better, and this is why they get to charge higher prices. The innovations that these products bring are creating strong competitive advantage for their companies. And so this is one of the reasons why innovation for them is so essential. Second one, top right. A company pursues a dominant strategy when it targets all consumers in a market with a new product or a service that does the job significantly better and for significantly less money. Examples here include, for instance, Google search, Uber, but also, for instance, Netflix for a while had a dominant strategy. The innovations of products like this are creating dominant competitive advantage, and this is why companies pursue them. The innovation required for dominant designs aim at capturing the allegiance of the whole marketplace. The next box, bottom right, this is the disruptive strategy. This is when a company targets overserved and new customers with a product that can do the job for them more cheaply and not as well as the competition. Examples here can be Google Docs compared to Microsoft Word. It's free, it does the job a little less uh, sophisticated way. So uh, Door Shave Club, for instance, compared to Gillette. The innovation with this type of strategies focuses on delivering a more basic experience for less money. So this is another way that innovation helps companies succeed in the marketplace. The fourth box uh, on the bottom left, this is the discrete strategy. This is when a company offers an inferior product that gets the job done worse. And they offer it to a restricted customer for more money. Here is uh, an example to clarify how this can exist. Um, drinks and snacks at sporting or entertainment events. We have restricted customers who have no choice but to pay five to ten dollars for a bottle of water. I don't know that there is a lot of innovation we're talking about for these kind of situations, but it is a model that helps companies maximize ROI. And this is another reason to innovate and think out of the box. And by the way, there is also the, this last uh, box, the circle in the center, the sustaining strategy. This is when companies offer slightly better new products, which get the job done slightly better or for slightly less money. So there are many examples for this kind of strategy and the innovation here is definitely uh, of the incremental type. So um, to summarize, companies innovate so that they can successfully pursue different competitive strategies in the marketplace. And all of this is outward facing. All of the reasons for innovation we talked about so far are about the customer, how to win the competition for the customer. And there's nothing wrong with this, this is, this is great, but, but there is one more reason and it's really important to mention and when done right innovation will have a positive impact on the company culture so here is a few quotes uh, i'm going to read for you you don't build a business you build people and then people build the business zig ziglar if you take care of your employees they will take care of your customers and your business will take care of itself jw bill marriott Clients do not come first, employees come first. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of the clients, Richard Branson. So how do we build people? In my opinion, in, in my experience, the answer to this question has a lot to do with why innovation is so important in today's business. 
there are many aspects to building people up and to helping them succeed in their careers and empowering people to create, to innovate, to bring into existence new, new, more exciting, more valuable products, features, services. This is what innovation is. And this is how we help people grow. And then as a result, they create and implement successful innovation strategies that take care of the business. This is where culture matters. This is where, as we saw before, most organizations admit they're lacking. And this is where we as product managers have the most opportunity to have an impact. So, Kerry mentioned this, let's step into another uh, kind of definition, going deeper into the what is innovation all about. And uh, we're going to look at the four pieces of innovation. Paradigm innovation. This is um, basically based on the book, uh, The Structure of Scientific uh, Revolutions, where physicist and uh, philosopher Thomas Kuhn introduced the concept of paradigm shift as a fundamental change in the core concepts, values, and practices of a scientific community or discipline. So similarly, paradigm shifts, uh, paradigm shift innovations uh, drive and sometimes both drive and uh, transform informed are informed by the shift that they may already be uh, happening in the marketplace. An, an example of a paradigm shift is when Apple introduced the iPod. The music delivery was forever changed. Because of that, other paradigm shifts later, like Spotify, became possible. These paradigm shifts happen when the right conditions are present, of course, and a tipping point in both technology and markets is reached, and the innovation then can cause and simultaneously lead paradigm shifts. The next one is uh, process innovation, and this is when uh, change, uh, this is a change in the way a product or service is created uh, or delivered. Process innovation could mean introducing greater automation in the manufacturing process, or rethinking best practices and supply chain management, or even changes to how um, improvements are measured. It's important to mention that process management is mainly about optimization and identifying the key drivers of optimization will be critical. Position innovation, from a business perspective, position is um, the products uh, or services positioning within the marketplace. Position innovation creates a change in the context in which the product or services are introduced or uh, positioned in the marketplace and thereby changing the perception of the consumers. For instance, a little known fact, the massive global success of the Marlboro brand started when this brand switched its positioning. It was initially a brand of cigarettes targeting women. Then through the introduction of the legendary Marlboro man advertising, the brand switched its positioning and that proved to be quite successful as the brand became a symbol of, you know, cigarettes for tough men and this way a global leader. Product innovation, this is perhaps the most self-explanatory of the four piece. Uh, product innovation is about creating new or making changes to products or services uh, uh, that their organization offers. And this is where most of us will have the opportunity to practice innovation and have an impact. So while we're discussing what is innovation and uh, different aspects, and uh, there is one critical aspect that I, I want to specifically address. The new in innovation is pointless if it lacks improvement. Any, anything that's introduced as a new feature or a new product needs to be addressing this. This is where businesses struggle the most, how to bring about a meaningful value-based cycle of innovation. In the many obstacles, uh, sorry, the many uh, instances, um, it's because of the old silo-based thinking and, and the divide and conquer approach that focuses on the team success and in the process. Sometimes it fails to account for the larger product or the larger company strategy. So how we measure success in our narrow team focus needs to align and contribute to the global purpose of the product, the service, the company. So. In summary, new has to equal improved. And how do we measure improvement? The answer to this question becomes critical to how we measure success. Oftentimes, as product managers, we are encouraged to keep a narrow focus and uh, um, our own piece of the product is what matters the most. 
This is necessary in larger product organizations to avoid duplicate work and to allow for deep learning and subject matter expertise in some areas. But sometimes, as a result, organizations create more issues. And the main one is they lose focus of the problem they're solving. We, as product managers, we have all been part of this. We get together at the ideation or brainstorming meeting, and before we have any solid uh, or shared understanding of the customer problem we're solving, we start listing ideas of how to solve it. And in everybody's head, there is a slightly different version of what exactly are we solving for. And very soon, it's only human nature, we, we start falling in love with our ideas and we build solutions around these ideas and, and we do everything we can to make these solutions work. So, so this is why it's critically important to pick the right framework for product innovation. And by right, I mean the framework that will allow your team to keep relentless focus on the customer problem, something that you're working on. And will also allow your organization to align around a value-driven approach to measure success across all teams. So speaking of frameworks, there are conceptually large number of successful approaches to making innovation work. Uh, you can see similarities, similarities in many, many of them, but the key takeaways here is pick the framework that fits your needs and then experiment, experiment with a few to see which one pro produces the best results. Uh, the ones that I'm presenting here, for instance, uh, on the top left, uh, this takes into account the market weaknesses, the internal strengths of the organization of the business, any adjacent possibilities, and then works from there to deliver the innovation. The next one is uh, from the Design Thinking Foundation, and this is basically uh, starting from empathize and define. This is the step. These are the steps where you know you, you don't define a solution. This is where you define the customer product, and only after you have gone through these first two steps of understanding the customer problem, the customer emotions, and all that, then you start ideating and then building prototypes, testing, et cetera, et cetera. And as you can see with those, these um, arrows and, and uh, lines, that it's an iterative process. Now, the last one that I'm presenting here is a design thinking framework from the uh, United Nations. And um, again, you can see in the, in the first phase, discovery phase, you know, we seek to understand the human needs that are involved and then reframe and define the problem in human-centric ways. The first two steps are about basically the problem. So all in all, uh, frameworks are about helping us as a team and as product managers innovate with one core thing in mind. We have to fall in love with the problem, not with our solutions. And uh, speaking of frameworks, um, there is another framework that I found very uh, useful and very helpful in my um, in my previous projects and uh, my previous jobs. And, and this is the nine box prioritization framework. This is for when um, you have way too many items on your product backlog. And um, this is a relatively simple way to, to make uh, things clear and to basically communicate the value of the priorities that you are choosing as a team. On the vertical, you have the severity of the problem. So at the top of this, uh, there are going to be problems that essentially are so severe that uh, the customer is not going to do business with us anymore. And on the horizontal, we have the total size of the market that this um, feature or issue or whatever is addressing. Uh, if it's a small number of people, then it's on the left. If it's more than 50%, then it's on the right. So this is the kind of priority that, uh, um, as, a, as a discussion point, every every team can go through their backlog and, and try to place each of their their features and backlog items into into a frame frame like this, and very quickly, the items that are important uh, and need to be worked on will surface this way. So in any case, whatever framework you decide to use, remember that uh, as product managers, we own the outcomes for our innovations. And 100% of these outcomes will be validated by the market. So, so it's essential to plan innovation with this in mind. What is the fastest, shortest way to have an impact on the experience and the satisfaction of your customer? 
how can you help them solve their problems faster, better, cheaper? And here is some more market research data points, some more context. According to a survey conducted jointly by MIT and Deloitte, 81% of respondents to digitally mature company cite innovation as the strength of their organization, compared to only 30% from developing outfits and only 10% from early stage companies. It's kind of counterintuitive, but uh, it's good to um, keep in mind. According to a Gartner survey, the top drivers for innovation today include enhancing customer experience, 53%, driving revenue growth 53 percent and developing new products and services 45 percent a nurse and young survey identified that more than one quarter of the c-level executives surveyed said that they have a designated innovation leader such as a chief innovation officer in place at their organization 42 percent by the way say that they will create such a role to foster innovation 65 percent of high growth companies plan to collaborate with customers during the innovation process compared to 54% of other companies. This is a survey by Accenture. 86% of respondents from a digitally maturing companies say that 10% or more of their time at work involves the opportunity to experiment and innovate. This is from an MIT uh, management review and the wide survey. And, um, 91% of marketers surveyed are leading and supporting innovation initiatives. 62% say they are solely responsible for such initiatives. And 62% of high growth companies plan to invest in technologies that lead to higher rates of innovation compared to 54% of other companies. So in other words, innovation has always contributed to better business and better serving the customer needs. And in the future, businesses will rely more and more on innovation that can deliver results reliably and in a predictable manner. So another reason to learn how to innovate effectively in the context of business and technology. So to wrap it up, here is a list of key takeaways and key ideas from this uh, in no particular order. The new in innovation needs to equal better. Otherwise, companies will see these diminishing results. How we measure success in our narrow team focus needs to align and contribute to the global purpose of the product, the service, the company. As product innovators, we own the outcomes. So let's plan accordingly. Companies innovate so that they can execute successful business strategies. And 100% of the success of the business strategy is going to be validated by the customer. And a key takeaway, success for the business will come from building their employees up and giving them the tools to serve their customers better. A culture that empowers the employees to innovate will be a winning culture. This is the main role of innovation. This is the reason why employees work hard to make businesses successful. Innovation is what brings meaning to the workplace. And last but not least, in order to be successful at innovation, make sure it is everybody's job blameless culture is difficult to implement but it will encourage everyone to practice and to participate and to contribute and this is when we will get the best results for the organizations and for the customers so and obviously fall in love with the problem not just your solution um, thank you for your attention thank you and i appreciate the time and if you want to learn more uh, visit us at productmanagement.team on the web.